Good morning, everybody. Yeah, welcome to Peace Evangelical and Reformed Church. It's great to see you on this beautiful summer Sunday morning. And it's hard to believe we're already into the second week of August. And it is with some remorse and sadness and empathy that I remember that this coming weekend would have been the weekend for Gospel Fest. And so I just want to continue to remember all the bands that are going through COVID-19 time just like we are. Um, also for um, announcements, we have some anniversaries and birthdays in the Peace Church family. Gene and Gene Poggle Hoyer and Jerry Hoyer are celebrating their anniversary. Um, Kyle and Amanda Hackbarth have an anniversary. Steve and Sherry Hernke, Chris and Carrie Jukum, Tim and Amy Hansen, and Ron and Rhonda Vanden Bogard have their anniversary this week. Also for birthdays, Beckham Stecker turns one year old today. Marissa Swear is a birthday. Joan Brame, Bill Lurkey, Maria Halbach this week. Davy Kiso turns 18, and Evan Strzeski turns seven years old. So happy anniversary and happy birthday. And this week is my 24th anniversary at Peace Evangelical and Reformed Church. That came up pretty quick, so praise God. And so I'm celebrating an anniversary. <laughs> and also for announcements, youth group meets tonight at 6.30 p.m. at <clears throat> Blake and Brenda and Bob Van Dalwick's home. And also from, for the prayer list, we want to continue to remember Fuzzy Weeding in prayer. He had a pacemaker installed this past week. Um, Don Whitman had um, a stent put in, and he's doing well. In fact, there he is. Don, good to see you. <laughs> Need to keep <clears throat> Lori Newshart in prayer. She restarted chemotherapy on Friday. We want to remember Dick Gast in prayer as he um, courageously and fiercely battles cancer. And then this week, I had to wear a heart monitor. They're <clears throat> checking my heart to see if there's AFib or something like that. Me personally, I think it's too much coffee, not enough sleep, and a little bit of stress, because that can do all the same stuff. But, you know, I, I believe in checking things out. And I think once I turned 50 years old, my doctor started, switched gears, and so we're checking this out, we're checking that out. And, you know, thank God for that. I guess that's, that's the, you know, the standard thing that, they're supposed to do. So I guess I'm requesting prayers also for good test result this week on the heart monitor test. And if that's clear, they're going to make me run the treadmill. And then after that, uh, hopefully I'm, I'm in the clear. So um, prayers and for, for that. We have any other announcements to highlight? Yes, bud. Okay, 6.30 p.m., CRT meeting, crisis response tomorrow night. Okay. And this concludes our morning announcements. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. And Father God, we love you so much. We thank you that in these crazy and unsettling and uncertain times in which we live, you are seated on the throne and Christ is standing at your right hand. We give you thanks and praise for your sovereignty over the kingdoms of men and women. And we dedicate our whole worship service to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us stand together and we'll sing our <clears throat> opening song of worship. Come thou, almighty King.
Amen. Let's remain standing for the reciting of the Apostles' Creed, which is found before us on the screen. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the one holy universal Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. And we have a special music presentation from Paula. I inherited some music from a good friend, a younger friend um, who used to babysit for our kids, Chris Ott. She died of cancer, and her sister gave me some music of hers. And this is a whole volume of Amy Grant songs. So, this is Angels. man to prison the man heard Herod say and then four squads of soldiers came and carried him away chained up between two watchmen Peter tried to sleep but beyond the walls an endless prayer was lifted for his key then a light shone through the darkness of a lonely prison cell and the chains that bound the man of God just opened up and fell and running to his people before the break of day there was only one thing on his mind only one thing to say angels watching over me every move I make angels watching over me angels watching over me every step I take angels watching over me God only the times my life was threatened just today a reckless car ran out of gas before it ran on my way near misses all around me accidents unknown though I never see with human eyes the hands that lead me home but I know they're all around me all day and through the night when the enemy is closing in I know sometimes they fight to keep my feet from falling I'll never turn away if you're asking what's protecting me then you're gonna hear me say angels watching over me every move I make angels watching over me angels watching over me every step I take angels watching over me over me every move I make angels watching over me angels watching over me every 
every step I take, angels watching over me. Angels watching over me, angels watching over me, angels watching over me, angels watching over me. Our social distance children's sermon. Okay, next year is a milestone year. It's going to be my 25th anniversary at the church, but also it's the church's 150th anniversary. So it's a double milestone year. And I was thinking about what could we do to celebrate. And you know, I think that usually for a big milestone year like that, you don't just celebrate on one day. You have different things throughout the year. And so I thought, well. Our windows are so beautiful. You know, maybe as part of the year, I can go through each biblical scene in sermons and explain the meaning of each and every window and then be finished by the time of the actual anniversary date. I thought that would be really neat. And I was thinking about the, the windows because the gospel story is on there. And a lot of our favorite windows is that one right there, of Jesus knocking on the door of our lives, and that comes from Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20, where he's hoping the Laodicean church is going to let him in. But really, all the windows tell the gospel story. A long time ago, a lot of people didn't know how to read. Maybe up to half the Roman Empire wasn't, they didn't know how to read on their own. And so they could look at the artwork in the church meeting place and learn the gospel story that way. And so this, and this goes back to a long tradition of how we have taught the gospel throughout our history. And for those of you who are watching, don't forget, Jesus is always knocking on the door of your heart. And if you open the door of your heart, and he will come in, and you will have eternal life. You repent of your sins, you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, he comes into your heart, and you are saved. You are on Team Jesus forever. Jesus loves you. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. And now at this time, we will have our scripture reading. And I prepared a program of end time events. Is, do we have that available on the screen. This is sort of, um, if we were allowed to pass out bulletins, I would have given you a program. You know how you go to a play and you have a program of everything that happens in order? This is everything that's going to happen in order in the end times. The first, the next event on the end time calendar is the rapture of Christians into heaven. It could happen today. It can happen before the service is over. At any moment, that's the next event. The next event on the program is Christians stand before the judgment seat of Christ to be rewarded and rebuked for how they lived for Christ on earth. The third event on the calendar is we celebrate in heaven and dine at the wedding supper with Christ. And we've already, that, that's our destiny as believers in Jesus. We've already covered that. While the celebration goes on in heaven, We did this one last week. This was the scary one, right? Those who are left behind experience the seven-year tribulation in the day of the Lord's wrath. And we said if you're, God put that in the Bible so that people would be forewarned and that nobody would go there and that we'd all have an opportunity to receive Jesus and his love for us. But that is the destiny for those who shake their fists at God to the very end. And today, we're covering number five on the program. Christians return with Christ from heaven at his second coming to reign with him over the earth. And then after that, Jesus separates the sheep and the goats, and the goats don't get into the kingdom. The sheep do get in for a thousand years. That's the next slide. And then this 1,000-year reign of Christ on the earth where we will live in a world like our own today, but no more sin and no more evil, and everybody will be under the lordship and leadership of Jesus Christ. And we'll talk 
later about, in a later sermon about why that has to happen, why there has to be a thousand year period. Then after that, the final judgment for everyone who ever lived before the rapture. So if the rapture happens today, the final judgment is for everybody who died before today, who doesn't know Christ. And then number nine, we live, yeah, I hate to use the expression happily ever after, but God and Christ and Christians live together forever in the new heaven and in the new earth. So that's our program. That's the big picture. And today, we're on number five. And our reading is in Revelation chapter 19. <clears throat> we looked at verses one through ten already. That was number three on the program. But in verse 11, we pick up with number five. John says, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire, <clears throat> and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him <clears throat> that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun who cried in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair, come gather together for the great supper of God so that you may eat the flesh of kings, generals, and mighty men, of horses, generals, of horses and their riders in the flesh of all people free and slave, small and great. Then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together <clears throat> to make war against the rider on the horse and his army. But the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who had performed the miraculous signs on his behalf. With these signs he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur, the rest of them were killed with the sword that came out of the mouth of the rider on the horse, and all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. This is the word of God, and may the Lord add his blessing to the reading and reflecting upon his precious word. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the scriptures, and I pray now that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be faithful to the scriptures. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm not a big fan of ultimate fighting, but I like the way the announcer, Bruce Buffer, introduces the combatants. And I've often wondered to myself, what would it be like if he was the guy that was picked by God to introduce Jesus Christ at his second coming? And I suspect it might go something like this. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time! Coming to earth, riding a white horse is the one who is called faithful and true. With justice, he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire. On his head are many crowns. He is dressed in a robe, dipped in blood. He has a name known only to him himself, but we know him as the Word of God. We know him by the title that is written on his robe and on his thigh, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the armies of heaven are with him. Introducing the reigning, the ruling, the defending, King of all kings and Lord of all lords, the Alpha 
and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end, the second person of the Trinity, the eternal Son of God, the return of the King. Let us lift up our voices and give a hand to the Lord Jesus Christ. The second coming of Jesus Christ is going to be the most awesome event in the history of the planet going up since the first coming of Christ. It's going to be a time where the king is going to occupy his throne on the earth. Today we'll look at Revelation 19, 11 to 21 and discuss the reality of the second coming, the description of the second coming, and the significance of the second coming for our lives today. And the sermon is called, The Return of the King. Mark Hitchcock, in his book, The End, mentions five things about the reality of Christ's return. Number one, he will return personally. He's not going to send his Secretary of State. He's not going to send the National Security Advisor. He's not going to send the ambassador to the United Nations. He's not going to send somebody from the Trump administration. Revelation chapter 22, verse 7, he says, Behold, I am coming soon. Number two, Jesus Christ will return visibly. The Jehovah Witnesses teach that Jesus Christ came back in 1914 and that he reigns over the Jehovah Witness headquarters this day in Brooklyn, New York. Now, I grew up in New York, and I just want to say that of all the beautiful places in this world where Jesus could live, I would be shocked if he chose Brooklyn, New York. <laughs> We've been there. They have great kosher food. Just wouldn't be my first choice. Secondly, the scripture is clear that Christ is not returning secretly or invisibly, but visibly to all. How do I know that? Revelation 1 verse 7, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him, so shall it be. Amen. Number three, Jesus Christ will return dramatically. Matthew 24, 29 says, The sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. And at that time, at that dramatic moment, you'll see the sign of the Son of Man appearing in the sky. And you'll, he'll be coming with the clouds, with power and great glory. And number four, Jesus Christ will not only return personally and visibly and dramatically, he will return certainly. Years back, Jeannie and I had an 18-month CD at Capital Credit Union in Appleton guaranteeing us 4%. Right now, it seems very likely that the rapture is going to happen before we ever see a 4% return on a CD ever again. I mean, that's just what the economy is doing right now. But we were not worried at all about our money because we knew that when it came due on January 14th, 2015, that money will have accrued 4%. Well, my friends, we have a guarantee that's even greater than what the FDIC can give us. We have the guarantee of God's infallible, inerrant word that Jesus Christ is coming back. There are 1,845 references to the second coming of Jesus Christ in the Bible. Believe it or not, only 318 in the New Testament, and 22 times Jesus speaks of it himself. It is a guarantee that he will return. And number five, Jesus will return triumphantly. And that's what we see in today's reading from Revelation 19. Let us look first at the description 
of the returning king. In Revelation 19.11, John says, I saw heaven standing open. Now remember earlier in Revelation 4 verse 1, John just saw a door into heaven open, but now all of heaven is torn open. Remember when Jesus got baptized, we're told in, Mark, in, in, in the Gospel of Mark that heaven was torn open? We're going to see it torn open again. And this fulfills the prayer of Isaiah the prophet in Isaiah 64 verse 1 when he prayed, O oh Lord, that you would part the heavens and come down. That prayer is finally being answered. You know, our prayers don't always get answered right away. You know that, right? Sometimes we pray and we get an immediate answer to our prayers. The other day I couldn't find my keys and Jeannie and Daryl were working on technical difficulties in the sound booth and Daryl prayed and like three minutes later I found my keys. Praise the Lord. But you know it doesn't always work that way. You know, sometimes we got, you know, heaven's standard time is not the same thing as central standard time. God's time is not the same thing as man's time. And so finally, this particular prayer gets fulfilled. Then John says there before me was a white horse. A white horse was the traditional horse ridden by a victorious Roman general. If you remember back in Revelation chapter 6 verse 1, the Antichrist rode a white horse because he saw himself as a victorious Roman general, but now the real Christ is coming back on his white horse. And the text says that his name is faithful and true in contrast to the unfaithful and untrue Antichrist. Then John says in verse 11, with justice he judges and makes war. Jesus does not wage war unjustly or unfairly. He's not going to be unfair in any way, shape, or form. He is a God and Messiah of justice. David Guzik writes, this is a Jesus we cannot control. This is a Jesus we cannot domesticate. This is a Jesus that we cannot neuter or water down to make him acceptable to mainline or megachurch masses. This is the true Jesus of the Word of God. Guzik says this dramatic display of judgment comes only at the end of a long period of grace, patience, and mercy. This is no rush to judgment. Jesus has amply displayed his nature of mercy and grace to this fallen world. He now comes to judge a world hardened and totally given over to rebellion against him. Verse 12 adds three further descriptions to the king. His eyes are like blazing fire. This represents his judgment and his penetrating gaze and wisdom and insight. He peers into the very depths of our souls. He sees every act. He sees every thought, every emotion. The one who looked straight at Simon Peter in Luke twenty-two sixty-one, 61, after he denied Jesus three times, is looking straight at you. The one who could see the hypocrisy and duplicity of the Pharisees can see inside every human heart. Hebrews 4.13 says everything will be uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. He knows you like nobody else. He knows you better than you know yourself. Now such a reality should both thrill you and terrify you. He knows you in all of your sin and your depravity and your wickedness. And yet, in spite of that, he still loves you. He still cares about you. I read someplace that a friend is somebody who knows all about you and still likes you anyway. If that's true, then there is no truer friend than Jesus Christ, who knows all of the imperfections of the people of faith, and he still reaches out to them. He still knocks on the door of their lives. Verse 12 also says that on his head are many crowns. Now this is a different word that is, that is used to describe the five crowns that we're going to get when we're in heaven. 
The crowns that we get are victory wreaths, like what they give athletes when they win an Olympic prize back in Roman days. But the word that's used here is the word diademata. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. The crowns that Jesus is wearing are crowns of royalty, crowns of divinity, crowns that can only be worn by the Son of God. Verse 12 also says he has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. Well, Jesus has many names that we know about already. Emmanuel, God with us, Lord, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. Son of God, Savior, Redeemer, Alpha and Omega, first and the last, beginning and the end. But the name known only to he himself reminds us that you can't make a cookie-cutter Jesus, that there is a complexity and a mystery and a wonder to Jesus that words cannot express and depths to Jesus that human beings have not yet known or experienced. Verse 13 also says that Jesus is dressed in a robe dipped in blood. It could be his own blood, reminding us that he shed his precious blood on the cross to pay the price for our sins. But I think it's highly likely that the blood is the blood of his enemies. Because if you go to Isaiah chapter 63 and read the first three verses, it talks about the Lord coming back and going through Edom and his robe and his garments are stained with the blood of his enemies. Verse 13 also says that his name is the Word of God. That's a name of Jesus that we do know. He's called the Word of God in John 1.1. 1, 1. And when John says his name is the Word of God, for the first time, now we know for sure he's talking about Jesus Christ. Because in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. And the Word became flesh. John 1.14. 1 John 1.1 1, 1 refers to Jesus as the Word of Life. He is God's perfect alphabet. He's God's perfect communication and revelation. He is the full expression of all that God is. That's what it means for Jesus to be the Word of God. That's our description of the returning king. He's awesome. Now notice the authority of the returning king. Beginning in verse 14, the armies of heaven are following him, riding on white horses, dressed in fine linen. That's us. We were raptured to go to be with the Lord. Remember, Jesus came back for his saints. Now we're coming back. He's coming back with his saints to occupy and take over the world. Now notice the text, though. A lot of us imagine that we're going to go out there and fight, and I'm going to put on my Muhammad Ali, and I'm going to punch out some people and say, Hey, Jesus, I just took this guy out. Bam, bam. It's not going to roll like that. Notice our text. It says, it doesn't say we are fighting for him. It says we are following him. The Lord Jesus Christ did not need our help when he went to the cross to redeem us from our sins. And he's not going to need our help to come back to judge those who continue to sin. We are not gladiators. We are spectators at what Jesus Christ is going to do at his second coming, which is good because I hate that kind of hard work. I'm so glad that he's going to take care of it and I'm just going to be able to hang out and witness it. Verse 15, out of his mouth come a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. This portrays Christ's word of judgment and authority. It fulfills Isaiah 11 verse 4. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. He will rule them with an iron scepter for a thousand years. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. Yes, God is a God of grace and love and kindness for all who receive him, but for those who rage against him to the dying of the light, he is a God of wrath and anger. And it would be biblically 
incorrect for me to only tell you about the one and not tell you about the other, to paint a portrait of God that might be more palatable for the masses but might get me in trouble with God for misrepresenting him. We need to see both aspects of our great God and Savior. On his robe is the title King of Kings and Lord of Lords because that's exactly who he is and nothing less. This shows us the authority of the returning king. Now let's look at the triumph of the returning king. Verse 17, an angel speaks in a loud voice to the birds of the air, come gather together for the great supper of God, so you may eat the flesh of kings and generals and mighty men and horses and their riders and the flesh of all people, free and slave, small and great. Well, what's this about? William Newell, in his commentary on either Revelation or Romans, I can't remember which one that I saw it in, but he says there are four suppers in the Bible. Number one, the supper of salvation that people are invited to in Luke 14, the parable of the banquet. Number two, the Lord's Supper, which we take in church once a month. Number three, the wedding supper of the Lamb, which we're going to eat up in heaven. And number four, this supper, the great supper of God. The first three suppers are suppers of grace for all those who love and trust in Jesus. The fourth supper is a supper of judgment. If you repent of your sins and receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, you will be invited to the first three suppers. You'll participate in the wedding supper of the Lamb. You'll experience the God's fatherly love and the grace and kindness of Jesus forever and ever. But if you reject and rage against Christ all the way to the second coming, not only will you not be invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb, you will be the main course. You will become supper for the birds of the air at his return. That's what our text is saying. John Piper says just as Roadkill is ready for the vultures, so also the unrepentant, unbelieving world will be ready for the judgment of Christ. The Antichrist and his armies will try to make war against the rider on the white horse. Even seeing Jesus in person is not enough to convince people that maybe they should repent. That's one thing at least I love about the Jewish people. We know from Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, they're going to see the one they have pierced. They're going to mourn for him. Paul says in Romans eleven twenty six that all Israel will be saved. Right away, Jewish people on earth are going to say, he is our Messiah. We were wrong. Yeah, Pastor Mark and Peace Church and all the Christians, they were right. He's our Savior. And they're going to get saved at the last second. It's going to be awesome. But a lot of people in their insanity and their depravity and hostility, they actually think that they could fight against Jesus. That they could fight against God. But the beast and the false prophet will be captured and thrown into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. And everyone else will be killed with the sword of judgment that comes from Christ's mouth. And just like that, the battle of Armageddon will be over in a flash. Chuck Swindoll says, before anybody can utter the word Armageddon, the battle of Armageddon will be over. (laughs) First round knockout. John Phillips writes these words. Jesus spoke a word to a fig tree, and it withered away. He spoke a word to the wind and the waves, and the storm clouds vanished, and the waves fell still. He spoke to a legion of demons, bursting at the seams of a poor man's soul, and instantly they fled. Now he speaks a word, and the war is over. The blasphemous beast is stricken where he stands. The false prophet, the miracle-working windbag from the pit of hell, is punctured. And still another word, the panic-stricken armies reel and stagger and fall down dead. Field marshals and generals, admirals and air commanders, soldiers and sailors, rank and file, one and all, they fall. Every knee will bow in heaven and on earth 
and under the earth, and every tongue confess Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. As you can see, there's a big difference between Christmas and Armageddon. There's a huge difference between the first coming and the second coming. The first time he came to earth as a baby in a manger. The second time he comes as a king riding a white horse. The first time he comes as a suffering servant. The second time he comes as king of kings and lord of lords. The first time he comes to earth in humility and meekness. The second time he comes in majesty and power. The first time he came to suffer the wrath of God for sinners. The second time he comes to administer the wrath of God to sinners. And establish the kingdom of God for the saints. The first time he was rejected by many. The second time he will be recognized by all. The first time he came to seek and to save the lost. The second time, he comes to judge those who choose to stay lost. 2 Timothy 4.1 says he will come to judge the living and the dead. The first time, he wore a crown of thorns. The next time, he wears a crown of glory. The first time, he came to be the crucified king. The second time, he comes to be the conquering king. The first time he came to redeem the world, the next time he comes to reign over the world. Handel's Messiah. Revelation 11.15 The kingdoms of this world have now become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. End of story. Amen. What does the second coming of Jesus Christ mean? mean for us today? What is the significance of it? It means good's going to triumph over evil. God's in control. Jesus is Lord. There are, there's something to live for. There are better days ahead. And with that in mind, I have a homework assignment for all the Christians among us today. I want you to take whatever it is you're worried about and bring it to the Lord's feet. You know, we don't know how the coronavirus crisis will conclude. We don't know what the economy is going to be like next year. I can't even tell you for sure if, the United Sta if this is the beginning of the end for the United States or if rumors are of our demise are premature. I can't tell you any of that. What I can tell you is that Jesus Christ is coming back. Jesus Christ is going to right all the things that went wrong and we're going to come back with him and we're going to reign with him for a thousand years and then beyond that into eternity. So I want you to take whatever it is you're worried about and say, Lord, what I'm worried about right now seems fearsome and formidable, but I know that you are seated on the throne and Jesus is at your right hand and I'm trusting you to get me through this situation just like you've gotten me through every other situation in my life. The second coming of Jesus Christ gives the believer perspective to know that it's going to work out in the end. It's just like when you watch a YouTube clip. Sometimes I watch the Cleveland Browns play games on YouTube back in the old days when they were good. And, and they always won those games. <laughs> and I never worried about it because it was considered, it's a done deal. Similarly, because we have the word of God, it is a done deal that we know that Jesus Christ is coming back. Now, for those of you who have not yet received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I don't have homework assignment for you. I have a right now assignment for you that you believe on Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and make a decision to follow him. Jesus said in John 8, verse 12, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. I heard about a girl who was applying for different colleges, and she had to fill out a questionnaire before she wrote her essay. And one of the questions was, are you a leader or are you a follower? 
And she felt bad about that question because honestly, knowing herself, she's kind of introverted, maybe a little bit shy and reluctant and reticent. She doesn't consider herself a leader. She's more of a follower. And she said, well, I, I can't lie. I'm going to go down there and they're going to see me for what I am. So she wrote, checked off the box that said, I'm a follower. You know, she figured, well, they're not going to accept me now. A month later, she got an acceptance letter that she was allowed to come to the school. And in the letter, it said, we receive 1,433 applications, and we have 1,432 leaders. We figured we'd better give an invitation to at least one follower. <laughs> Jesus Christ is looking for at least one follower. Somebody who will say, you know what, Jesus has never been the most important person in my life, but now he is. I want him to be my king. I want him to be my master. I want to have a relationship with him. I want to be in heaven with him. I want to come back from heaven with him. I want to reign with him and rule with him and be with my loved ones in the Lord forever. He's knocking on the door of your life today saying if you open the door of your life to him, he will come in and you will be saved. Give your life to the one who gave his life for you and is coming back. Jesus loves you. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. Amen. Amen. Uh, thank you very much. And now we will sing our song of worship, Crown Him with Many Crowns. And here's the part of our service where we share our joys and concerns. I have on the prayer list that we're praying for Fuzzy Weeding, who had a pacemaker put in. Um, for Don Whitman, who's with us, he had a, a stent put in this week. For Lori Newshart, 
as she fights cancer, for Dick Gast as he fights cancer, um, for me as I wait on test results for my heart to make sure that that's okay, and also for a treatment and a cure for the virus. Are there any other prayer requests? Yes, Judy. Okay. Praying for all people who can't make it to church. And for those of you who are worshiping online with us, we love you and we welcome you and we're praying for you. Okay, any others? Yes, Don. Okay, um, a friend of Don's who's having a biopsy, 86 years old, first time ever in the hospital. Wow. Any others? Patricia. Continued prayers for Wally Sinabin. Okay, continued prayers for Wally Sinabin. Will do. Okay, and Dr. Tom. Okay, we're going to pray for Dr. Tom Young's mom. She f fractured her leg. She's kind of having a tough time recovering. We're going to keep her in our prayers. Okay, and yes, Wendy. Prayers for the family of Dory Reedy. Her grandson passed away last week, and he's only seven months old. Oh, that's so sad. Dory Reedy? Okay. The family of Dory Reedy, her grandson died only seven months old. That is so sad. We will pray for sure. Okay. Let us pray. Father, we want to bring these joys and concerns to you. We rejoice that you are sovereign over the kingdoms of men. We rejoice that you are crowned Lord of all. And we bring before you some of the, the concerns that have been put upon our hearts and our minds. We pray for Fuzzy Weeding as he recovers from having the pacemaker put in. He's going to have to take it easy for five or six weeks before returning to regular activities. We pray for healing in the name of Jesus. Um, Lord, we also pray for Chad Lurkey, who's with us today, for continued healing following meniscus tear surgery. We pray that he never needs surgery on that ever again, in the name of Jesus. Pray for Don Whitman's continued healing and recuperation and rejuvenation. Pray for Lori Neusehart, that her cancer will go back into remission and not come back. We pray for Dick Gast, that his cancer would go into remission and not come back. We also pray for a good health result for me, Lord, so I can con continue to minister the best I can for you here on this earth until my appointment does come to go to be with you. Lord, we also pray for Don Whitman's friend of 86. He's an 86-year-old man who is going to the hospital for the first time for a biopsy. We pray that that goes well and that his faith and trust would be in Christ. For Wally Sanabin, for continued grace and strength for him as he goes through sickness, and we pray for healing. For Dr. Tom Young's mom, who's struggling to recover after fracturing her leg, may the grace of the Lord Jesus be with her. For the family of Dory Reedy, her grandson died, only seven months old, and we grieve with those who grieve and ask for the comfort of the Lord to be with the child's family. We pray for President Trump and Governor Evers, and we pray for our senators and our justices and judges and representatives to do what is right. We pray for grace for the United States of America. We know we have sinned. We, we know we have transgressed your law and fallen short, but we also know that there are people in this country like us. We love you with all of our heart and soul, 
and for the sake of those who are praying night and day for this nation. We pray for a reprieve. We pray for grace. We pray for a holding back of the judgment for a little more time so that the full number of people who are destined for eternal life will respond to the gospel and believe and be saved. We pray also for all those who are caring for us, for pastors and teachers and doctors and nurses and healthcare professionals, those who are researching for a cure for the COVID-19. We pray you would give them success. We also pray for law enforcement and military. Watch over all of them as they watch over us. Most of all, God, we thank you for Jesus, who taught us to pray the Lord's Prayer, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And on the screen, you'll see opportunities to um, show, show continued love and support for the church. We just want to thank you for all you do for the church with all of our heart. Thank you for your love and support for the ministry of Peace Evangelical and Reformed Church. And now this, oh, we're going to do the doxology. I almost forgot. Let us stand together to praise God from whom all blessings flow. Father, thank you for these gifts and for the opportunity to give for your work and help us to use these gifts wisely. In Jesus' name, amen. And we'll remain standing for the closing song of the service, number 524. Oh, that's right, we don't have the hymnals. But it is, it is number 524. We have a story to tell to the nations.
I want to, before, I think we're going to have someone from CRT dismiss row by row. Are we doing that today? Oh, we're not doing that today? Okay, so I'll just give you this word of benediction. Peace to the brothers and sisters and love with faith from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. Amen. And God bless you and have an awesome day. And Jesus loves you. And go in peace. But the blood of Jesus, what can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus.